to come before you today and just worship you, lift your name up, say that you are worthy of it all, Lord. All of our praise, all of our adoration. Thank you that you're on the throne, that you're in control, that we can always trust you. We just want to worship you right here.
The scripture reading this week is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Hello, and I want to welcome you again uh, as we consider God's word and the timeless truths that it holds for us. And especially today and next week, I hope that these words will be of great encouragement and fill you with a lot of hope. Uh, before we get into the Word of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I would like to encourage you, if you haven't stopped by the chapel, to pick up your bottle for the Hope Pregnancy Center to fill it up, uh, that you would come by. The bottles will be in the foyer, and the chapel front door is open in the morning from uh, Monday through Friday from about 9 o'clock at least till noon. So. Feel free to stop by and pick one up. They will be there in a, in a basket there in the foyer. Would you join me in prayer at this time? Thank you, Father, that we could come together. It, we continue to look forward to the day, God, when we'll be able to see each other face to face. More glorious, Father, will that be when we see you face to face. But thank you, Father, your spirit is with us. It's changing us. It's transforming us. And thank you, Father, that it reveals to us the great and timeless truths of the word and the exceeding great and precious promises that encourage us day by day. Father, I just pray for the body here that you will continue to encourage each and every one of us and be at work in us to mold and fashion us into, into that beautiful bride for Christ's return. In the name of Jesus, amen. Last Sunday morning, when we were gathered together, a group in the prayer circle, one of the songs that was requested that we sing had, had these words to it. Hear the bells ringing, they're singing, that you can be born again. Hear the bells ringing, they're singing, Christ is risen from the dead. The angel up on the tombstone said, he has risen just as he said. Go and tell his disciples that Jesus Christ is no longer dead. Joy to the world, he has risen. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is risen. That is a testimony of the eyewitnesses that were there during the days of Jesus. Remember with me as the Gospels record the women going down the first day of the week, that Sunday morning, and they took with them the spices and ointments to finish the burial procedure of Christ's body. On the way down, they were asking amongst themselves, who's going to roll away that stone that we might have access to the body? Upon arriving at the sepulcher where Jesus had been buried, they found that the stone was already rolled away. They went in. There was no body there. And suddenly they saw two, two angelic beings. And the angels asked the women this question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen. Go tell his disciples. The women ran, went and told the disciples, and the disciples ran to the tomb and went into the tomb, and they found it just as women had said. He is risen. Later on in the gospel record, we find that these disciples and the women, they encountered the resurrected, the living Christ. Another eyewitness would be Paul the Apostle, the, the one who's writing this book of Thessalonians and, and other books of the Bible in the New Testament. 
Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let me point out something amazing that Paul the Apostle writes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 15, where he says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left, until the coming of the Lord, will not proceed those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Why would he write such words about Jesus Christ coming again? about the return of Jesus Christ. That, that You see what it says in verse 15? The coming of the Lord. Why would he write that? The coming of the Lord. Do you realize who's writing this? This is Paul the Apostle. In verse 16, look at what he says in verse 16 again. He will descend from heaven. He will return. He will descend from heaven. Why would he write that? This is Paul. The apostle, do you, do you remember the story about Paul's life? If you go back to Acts chapter 9, you will remember that, that Paul, who previously was known as Saul, who was a Pharisee, and he hated Christianity. He hated the followers, the disciples of Jesus Christ. He thought that they were, that they were promoting a hoax about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he went about from community to community to imprison them for the message that Christ was alive that he had risen from the dead. No way could he be alive and risen from the dead. How could he be coming again? This is the man who's writing here about the return of Jesus Christ. What happened in Paul's life? What happened in Paul's life that transformed him from one who disbelieved in the living Christ to one who became an advocate, a very vocal evangelistic advocate of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? We find that in Acts chapter 9. Look at what it says in verse 4, Acts 9 verse 4. On his way to Damascus, he encountered the living Christ. It says he, referring to Saul or Paul, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. I am Jesus. And then from that moment on, Saul, whose name was changed to Paul upon his conversion, realized that Jesus Christ is alive. He ascended to heaven. He's coming again. That Christ is risen from the dead. The church... The testimony of the church is it's born out of the fact of the resurrection. It's not just that the eyewitnesses can declare it so because they saw the living Christ, but that's, that's the birth of the church. The life of the church is in the resurrected Jesus Christ. How else do you explain from that day on, from Christ's resurrection till now, the church has grown to be a universal body celebrating the living Christ? And the growth of the church, the growth of the church hasn't come out of threats and violence toward other people. Oh, quite the contrary. Uh, the growth of the true church of Jesus Christ has grown out of love and grace toward others. Might I add, even toward their enemies. That's why the first day of the week, the celebration that we have on the first day of the week is so important to us. The women went down the first day of the week and they encountered the empty tomb. He's alive and our celebration on the first day of the week is a celebration of the living Christ. And I hope it is that for your life. Jesus Christ is no longer dead. Joy to the world, as the song says. Why is, why is the resurrection of Christ such joyous news for the world? 
because we all, we all have sinned and we all have come short of the glory of God. Sin abounds. We see it on the news every day. Things like racism, things like the abuse of power, violence, pandemics. How about even earthquakes, the shifting of the earth's tectonic plates? They all speak to us of sin. The secular man, he looks to science. He looks to, to the facts to try and find an answer for why these things occur and, and why don't we have answers for them? Why generation after generation are they carried on? The one place that the secular world will not admit and will not look to is what creation speaks to. The heavens declare the glory of God. We will not recognize the glory of God as a secularist, as a sinful world. The glory of God, that's what creation is all about. And it reveals out of God's glory our sinful life, our rejection of him. The moaning and the groaning that I've talked about of creation that we hear is trying to tell us that something's not right between creation and the creator. Oh, that our generation could hear creation's voice speaking about sin so we can learn about forgiveness and the healing to be found in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. This is what the Word of God says. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Let me insert here our iniquities. As Isaiah the prophet says, our iniquities. He who had no sin became sin for us. Our iniquities were laid on him, Isaiah the prophet says. Why? Look at what the end of Roman, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. So that in him, so that in Christ, we can become the righteousness of God. So that we could become right with God in right standing, reconciled to God. How do I know that, that the death of Jesus Christ was sufficient? Because I know the depth of my depravity. I know the depth of my sin. How do I know that what he did on the cross is sufficient to take care of the penalty of my sin against my creator? And it's found in the fact of his resurrection. That is what Paul the Apostle means when he says in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, look with me, who, referring to Jesus Christ, was delivered up for our sin, our trespasses. He was crucified for our sin. And see what it says at the end of the verse? He was raised for a purpose. He was raised for our justification so that we would know from the resurrection that we would know that we are right with God, that we are justified before God. That's what the resurrection declares for us. We don't need to die with the uncertainty of God's forgiveness because Christ is alive. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can know that you are forgiven by God fully and totally. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God that he extends to us through Jesus Christ is eternal life. Eternal life. And now see that the resurrection is joyous news, first of all, because it offers us hope. It offers us the assurance of our sins forgiven. But secondly, it offers us the hope of eternal life. It offers us the hope in the face of death that that's not the end. The gift of God. See that in Romans chapter 6? It says the gift of God is eternal life. We see in the resurrection the joyous news of the forgiveness of sin, but we also see in the resurrection of Jesus Christ the hope we have in the face of death, that death is really not the end, that Christ came to give eternal life, that just as Christ rose from the dead, so shall his people rise to everlasting life. And Paul talks about that here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, turn to chapter 4. Look at verse 13 with me. Notice what 
Paul the Apostle writes to encourage these Thessalonican saints, and not only them, but us today. The word of the, God, the, word of the Lord reads, verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no, who have no hope. We do not want you to be uninformed. We do not want you to be, some translations have the word ignorant. Eugene Peterson, in his, in his uh, rendering of the Bible called The Message, paraphrase, writes, we don't want you to be in the dark. I like that. We don't want you to be in the dark about this matter. And then he talks about death in terms of being asleep. Paul likens death to sleep. This is not soul sleep. It is the body, the physical body, that's laid to rest, but not the soul. The soul, the life of a person, the life of the person goes to be with Christ in his presence. I think the words of John Stott summarize it very well. Sleep is being used as a metaphor in talking about death. A human corpse lies in the grave still, as if it were resting and awaiting the resurrection. That it is appropriate to call death sleep and a graveyard a cemetery, meaning sleeping place in the Greek. But these metaphorical allusions to a dead body are not intended to teach that the condition of the soul during the interim period between death and resurrection will be one of unconsciousness. You see, there's every reason to believe that those who have died in Christ, while the body is laid to rest in the grave, asleep, the soul, which is not the body, but in the body, the soul goes to be present with the Lord. There are verses, and let me just point out a few of them that, that allude to this. For example, in chapter 4 here, look at verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so Jesus, through, excuse me, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Do you see what it says now? God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. God will bring with him in the air when Jesus comes back with him. They're with him. The, the, the imagery here is that the saints who have died, their bodies are resting in the grave, but their soul is present with Jesus and will return with Jesus. Paul the Apostle in Rome, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 writes these words, Be of good courage. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Away from the body, why? So that our soul, our life can be with the Lord. And in Philippians, th this is what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. You see what he says? My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Having my soul in the grave, just sleeping there, how would that be far better? But to depart from this, even this physical body so that my life can be in the presence of, of my Lord and my Savior, that would be far better. Someone once wrote about the transition of the soul at death, and I liked, I liked the picture very much, and so let me just share it with you. It goes like this. I am standing upon a seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She is an object of beauty and strength, and I stand and watch her 
until at length she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where the sea and sky come down to mingle with each other. And someone at my side says, there, she's gone. And just at that moment, when someone at my side says, there, she's gone, there are other eyes watching her coming and other voices ready to take up the glad shout, there she comes, and that is dying. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul the Apostle, hearing about some of the concerns of the Thessalonians, about those who had died and Christ hadn't returned, and so, so they were confused about the scenario and what's going to happen to those who were dead. What, what exactly is the program for those who have died because Christ hadn't returned? Remember, Paul had to hurriedly leave Thessalon- Thessalonica because of the persecution, and he didn't fully give them all the instructions he would have liked. He didn't, wasn't able to sit them through catechism classes as long as he would like to, to give them instruction. And that's a lot of what this letter is about. Remember, he, he writes to them about the importance of sanctified living, which we've been talking about, because there was further instruction they needed about abstaining from sexual immorality. And there was further instruction they needed about not being idle and not being lazy. And they needed further instruction, and that's why he writes these beautiful words, these words filled with hope to them about the fact of what will happen with the dead in Christ about, upon the return of Jesus Christ. And let's take a look at what he writes. Beautiful words, words that are filled with the hope, not only for that generation, but it has given hope to countless generations up until now and ongoing until Christ returns. Because Christ is alive. So too the day is coming when those who have died in Christ will return with him to receive their resurrected body. Who of us hasn't been touched by the sorrow, the grief of death of a loved ones? What hope this can bring to us and may it bring you the hope that will sustain you and encourage you today to press on in your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Let's look at what it says, beginning with verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The gospel. The gospel brings the hope of eternal life, the gift of God. The gift of God is eternal life. The gospel, the good news, the message, part of that good message, that that gospel message is the forgiveness of sin. And part of that gospel message is that death is not the victor, but Christ has conquered death and the promise of eternal life, the promise of resurrection. And those who, have, those who have died will return, will return with Jesus Christ to be clothed in a resurrected body, as Paul says here. And if you go into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about that resurrected body. He talks about it being a body that is imperishable. Oh, don't you look forward to that? Doesn't decay, doesn't grow old, doesn't have all the problems that we experience. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it talks, talks about growing old and, 
and all the weaknesses that come with it. But the resurrected body, hallelujah, when those graves open up and those bodies come out of the grave to be reunited with the soul and dwelling in them, to be like Christ, they're going to be imperishable bodies. All these aches and all these pains, folks, all the medication that we take today, all the rehab and everything we do is going to be left behind. Hallelujah. Countless generations. Oh, it's going to be a marvelous scene. Paul, the apostle, says these bodies that we receive, these resurrected bodies, will be imperishable. They will be, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says they will be immortal. That's why the resurrection is a message of hope. It's a message of hope. It offers to us what Peter calls, 1 Peter chapter 1, a living hope. A living hope because it's based upon and in a living Savior. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Hear the words of the Apostle Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his mercy, his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The gospel, the gospel, the living Christ, the living, the resurrected Christ that Paul encountered on the road to Damascus, that the disciples and the women encountered in the first century following the, the death and burial of Jesus Christ, the living Christ. He gives us a living hope. That's something, that's something that the Thessalonican culture, the, the pagan religions, they couldn't offer people. That's something that, that I want to offer you today. It's a living hope because it's based upon the living Christ, risen from the dead. Pagan cultures can't offer that to people. The, the Epicureans, during the days of the New Testament. What was their philosophy? If you go to 1 Corinthians, Paul writes about it. He says, let us eat and drink. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. If there's no resurrection, let's go out and party. Uh, let's just live life, enjoy it, and do whatever we want. Let's live more relativism out to the max. No accountability, nothing to look forward to. Let's just do whatever we want today because tomorrow we die. We turn to nothing. Uh, Theocritus, who was a philosopher of the 3rd century B.C., said this, hopes are for the living. The dead are without hope. Catullus, Catullus, who was a poet of the 1st century B.C., said, the sun can set and rise again. But once our brief light sets, there is one unending night to sleep through. He wrote a letter to a couple who had lost a son, and the best he could offer them were these words, I sorrowed and wept over your departed one. But really, there is nothing one can do in the face of such things. So please, comfort each other. No hope. No hope that there's something beyond the grave. No hope of a resurrection. No hope of eternal life. Eat, drink, because tomorrow you die. Is that what comforts you when you go to the cemetery? When you visit the graveside of a loved one? That that's all there is? Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. 1 Thessalonians is written so that we might know that even as Christ has risen from the dead, so too shall we. We'll continue on this next week. But let me ask you a truth because I need to know, no man's promised next week, no man's promised even tomorrow. I want to know, are you living with this hope in your life? Not do you know about it? Have you heard about it? Is it in here? Is it in here? Are you living with this hope in your life? Are you living in the freedom of the forgiveness of your sin? Are you confident? Are you confident of God's grace upon your life 
full forgiveness of sin, your justification, not because of what you have done for him, but because of what he, through Christ, has done for you? Are you living with that? Is that your blessedness today? Are you living, let me ask you, are you living, friend? Are you living with the expectation, the anticipation, even as 1 Thessalonians talks about chapter 4, his return? Are you living today with the expectation of the return of Jesus Christ? Does that mean anything to you? Does that stir you? Does that impact you, affect you? You know, the greatest, the greatest event for any of us to be expecting in life is not, are they going to be able to salvage the MBA? Or are they going to be able to salvage some kind of a major league baseball season? For that matter, it's not even, can we salvage a camp program? The, the greatest thing to be expecting is not getting married. It's not the birth of a child. It's not your career or graduation, as joyous, as joyous as those things are, and they're valuable things, important things. But what is the greatest expectation that you and I could have today that stands high above all others? Is it not what is known as the parousia? that Paul talks about here in Thessalonians. Perusia meaning the appearing. The appearing of our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Let me ask us, the bride, you and me, what is the most important thing? What is the, what is the above all, the ultimate thing we desire and long for and look forward to? Is it not the return of Jesus Christ? His coming again, and in His coming, the resurrection of all those who have put their faith and trust in Him to be reunited with Him and us all together with Him. Everything for us as disciples should pale in comparison to the longing for the return of Jesus Christ. He is our love. He is our, need I remind us, we are the bride you and me, we are the bride, and he is the bridegroom. We who long for the parousia, we who long for his appearing, it impacts the way we live out our life. We're not given to laziness. We're not given to careless living, to the practice of sin. We're not given to bigotry. We're not given to violence or apathy. Those don't characterize people who long for the return of Jesus Christ. We who live, let me say this, we who live with the expectation of his return, we who long for his return, we are stirred with a desire for the Spirit of God to be at work in our lives, to transform us into his image with ever-increasing glory. That is our desire. We come to the Spirit, as I said a couple of weeks ago, we come to the Spirit every day and we yield ourselves to Him and say, Spirit, use me as an instrument of righteousness. Conform and mold and make me more like Jesus Christ. You and me and you and you and you and all of us throughout the whole world who put our faith in Jesus Christ so that when He appears, we will be this beautiful bride of His. That's the passion of our heart when we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. It's not carelessness. It's not indifference. And we, let me add this, because this is what Paul's saying here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We who live with the expectation and anticipation and longing of the return of Jesus Christ, we grieve, we sorrow in death, but not as those without hope. For we find, we find a promise that comforts us in the time of life's darkness. He's coming again. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air to be with the Lord forever. Therefore, 
encourage one another with these words. Horatio Spafford wrote a beautiful hymn entitled, It Is Well With My Soul. One of the verses of that hymn has these words. But Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. It is well with my soul. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the blessed hope that we have of the resurrection unto life everlasting. The wages of sin is death. Thank you, Father, that Christ paid that penalty, that I could receive a gift, a gift called eternal life. Thank you, Father, that I do not have to grieve as those without hope, that when I go to the cemetery, Father, that when I visit the the graveside of loved ones who have put their faith and trust in you, of friends, of people throughout history, that I can know, Father, that that isn't the end. Death is not the victory. The victory is in Jesus Christ. Fill us with that hope, Father, even as we wait. May you stir us, Spirit, with the longing, the anticipation, the expectation of his return, that we might give ourselves to you to make us ready for that great and glorious day. In Jesus' name, amen.